Wonderful. Hello everyone, my name is Linda and instead of combining science and song uh, making, I, I combine software and storytelling. Um, I'm a children's book author and a programmer, but I haven't been neither of those for a very long time and I'm going to tell you a little bit in a while uh, of both of those things. But let me start with a story, because this story starts around the age most of you guys are uh, at. I, and like the best stories in the world, this story starts with a boy and a girl and a burning, burning teenage love. So I was 13 years old and this was 2001 and I was madly in love with the President of the United States, uh, the Vice President of the United States, Al Gore. And because I had all of this passion and energy and excitement, I know a lot of you uh, people over here had, I built him a website. And because there was no Tumblr, there was no Facebook, there was no Pinterest, I actually needed to learn PHP, I actually needed to learn HTML and CSS and how to set up my server. And boy, when I got this site up, I felt like so proud I made this happen. This is me and this is the world seeing how much I love Al Gore. <laughs> but later on in life, there were other boys. There were other things to get excited about, like arts and science and philosophy and music. And I forgot about programming and I forgot about coding. If you had asked me around your age what I thought about programming, I would have said it's something uh, green and black and glows with a matrix-like light of ones and zeros and, and just forgot about it. But when I was 24 years old, I was studying in Stanford University and they showed me a programming language called Ruby. And when I typed my first program in Ruby, I had the same excitement as when I was 13 years old that I made the computer obey my will. I made this happen. And uh, after that almost physical sensation of making something happen on the computer, I had this more intellectual pleasure of being able to build something out of nothing with the pure power of words. I was absolutely hooked on this, and I wanted to get other young women hooked on this too. So I co-founded an organization called Rails Girls, uh, which is a non-profit started in Helsinki four years ago that teaches young women their first experience in software craftsmanship. So during one weekend workshop, we build uh, an entire Rails application. We design it, we code it, and we deploy it online. And it started as something I did for myself and my best friends in Helsinki. And I never, never would have believed that it would become bigger and more people would be excited about this. But it did. So in 2014, four years after we co-founded this, it's been in over 227 cities all over the world. Places from Amman to Australia, from Belo Horizonte to Berlin, in places that I can't even pronounce. It's all run by volunteers. It's, it's when, when Sci-Fi was talking about the, the chaos and, and uh, those things, I, I think Rails Girls embodies these things. It's absolutely volunteer driven and people have really uh, started to like shape the way they things are made. So in Tampere, which is a small Finnish city, we had over 400 applicants signing up to learn about pro computer programming. Rails Girls kind of taught me to see programming as this vast, vast array of human experience, of creativity and creating something of your own. Uh, building a program is much like building your own little world where you control the vocabulary, the rules, the structures, every minute detail of your little world. And for a girl who loved Bernard Russell, who enjoyed conjugating French irregular verbs, who liked crafts uh, sessions and, and gardening and stuff like that, programming Programming was the perfect career opportunity. Why all of this is important then? Why are we all talking to you about software and engineering and, and uh, building stuff with technology? It's because uh, this famous, famous VC uh, called Mark Anderson said that software is eating the world. And you guys know it better than I do. You know that Snapchat and, and Instagram and WhatsApp and all of these software companies are changing the world far faster than legislation, civil service or even pop music nowadays. But it's not going to be a very beautiful future unless we change one thing. Most of the engineers in Northern California who are building these companies are 25-year-old males, white or Asian males, who have a pretty limited worldview of the problems they see. And we need more misfits, more people with different ideas and different solutions to build the world they vision. And that's where my storytelling career comes in. So meet little Ruby. Uh, she's a little girl who travels around the world, uh, sees, uh, meets all of these amazing creatures like 
the messy androids, uh, the snow, lonely snow leopard who doesn't want to play with the other kids, uh, the Linux the penguin who's really hard to understand at times, uh, and all of these quirky little characters from her, her own world. She learns that sometimes big problems are just small problems stuck together, that you need to separate those problems in order to, to make, uh, uh, make progress and that sometimes bugs indeed are real. They live under your bed, they have pointy teeth and infinite loopy tails. When I try to talk about this engineering and software culture that does exist, people oftentimes think that technology is inhumane. It's computers talking to one another and they forget that there is this whole culture and creativity and colorfulness in computing. It's just hidden in the murky underground internet forums out there. And that Computer science, when you try to explain it to someone who doesn't know and feel it actually what it is like, feels like a very introverted thing. The computer scientist just sits in front of the computer and types and the breakthroughs are absolutely silent. There might be like a Coke bottle that goes up like, yay, I fixed a bug. And my work has to do with sort of surfacing all of this creativity that happens inside of computing. From the tiniest, tiniest booleans to the immense, immense algorithms. So, when you go back to school, and I know UK has been like a front runner in this, this scene, I want you to tell to your teacher that it's our right to learn about computers. As Sci-Fi said, it's your right to learn what happens inside of a computer and how computers structure our world. When, after all, in school you do learn about how combustion engines work and how, how to be an astronaut and how, how the human body works, which is a, like a really complicated, weird thing. Uh, and when you ask your teacher, Oh, teacher, what is a bubble sorting algorithm? Or teacher, teacher, how does the internet work? Or teacher, teacher, what actually happens when I press play button on YouTube? Your teacher, and you can try this, they grow oddly silent and they mutter something about it being magic or it being complicated. Well, let me tell you, it's neither. It's not magic and it's not complicated. It just all happened really, really fast. Computer scientists of the past 30 years have done an amazing thing in creating layers and layers of abstraction, in making computers smaller and smaller, so small indeed that we don't have any idea how they work anymore. So one of the things we do in our, my workshops are that the kids actually do build a paper computer. I can show you a version here. So they build a computer and they learn about everything that goes inside of it. So they meet the bossy CPU, the helpful RAM, uh, the hard drive that stores your summer photos and, and where you're at uh, in your game, uh, the game level you're at. They, they drag a virus file inside and then see what happens when the, the whole computer explodes. And they do design their own first web application. The first thing the kids do is they design um, Angry Birds or a game, but when you prompt them a little bit further, things start to get really exciting. So I've had the pleasure of meeting a little girl she wants to be, she was maybe four or five years old, and she wanted to be a dolphin doctor when she grows up. She's very determined that she'll be a dolphin doctor. And what she did is she designed an application, a patient application, where she manages her dolphin's patient health data. And then there was this little guy whose favorite game in the world was to be a mission control man from his father, the lone astronaut on the other side of the room. So this little boy had his headphones on and he was operating his self-designed intergalactic planetary observation application to guide his father, the lone astronaut from the other side of the room, safely home from the Martian orbits. And these kids are going to have such a profoundly different experience of technology and seeing inside of a computer and, and thinking what is possible that I do wish that we all would have the same thing. I think all of you have stories that have stuck with you from childhood and do still shape the way you think and see the world. For me, that was Tuve Jansson. For some of you, it was maybe Roald Dahl. But stories are immensely, immensely important in uh, helping you understand who you are and what you represent. I think one of the most important things Sci-Fi said was that internet, the very fabric of internet is built on humanity and maybe a little bit of cats, but mostly humans. Internet is built on generosity of people and people helping one another. Code is written by programmers who are human, not computers. And I always tell that internet was my alma mater. It was the place where I got the most of my education and it's the people in the internet who help you do those things. So if we have 
a school called the internet, what should we be teaching in it? One of my uh, big thoughts or realizations was that instead, if JavaScript is really the li li lingua franca of the future, if, if that's your first foreign language, you learn English, Chinese, and JavaScript in school <laughs> as languages, maybe you shouldn't be taking grammar classes, maybe you should be taking poetry classes. So my storybook that I showed you a little bit earlier was an art project for myself. I'm not much of an illustrator, I'm a really bad, I don't speak English as my native language, but I had this vision of a world where there would be a little girl called Ruby and she would teach kids computational thinking. I put it on Kickstarter and it ended up re uh, gathering $380,000 in pre-orders over a period of a month, which is insane because I live in Helsinki and there's this whole world around me that is excited about this. And it became one of the most popular Kickstarter projects in children's book category. And even more importantly, it ended up being 20% of the annual Finnish book export sales, which is insane because I'm one person who's never published anything. So you see, <laughs> this is the era that we live in, this amazing era where had I gone to a Finnish book publisher and said that I have this idea about a children's book, about programming, they would have said, oh, Linda, there is no market for this stuff. And they would have probably been right because there is no market for a Finnish programming book. And had I gone to a VC and told them that I have this idea, please fund my uh, children's book project, they would have said that, oh, Linda, there is no profit in this. And they would have probably been right in that too. But we live in an era where you can self-teach, you can open source, and you can crowdfund. And that gives you an amazing artistic freedom to pursue the wackiest, wildest ideas you have out there. Every, oh, the only thing you need in life is a little bit of childlike wonder, optimism, idealism, and experimentation. And I do hope to see that in the next generation. Thank you. So for people here today who fancy being the next sci-fi or the next version of our next speaker who's pretty incredible as well, <laughs> what's the, what could they go and leave uh, today and what's the best way for them to start looking into coding? And so I absolutely Ruby? think, so first of all, your curriculum says that you're entitled to have computing as a class thing. So the one thing you can do is go to your school uh, principals and teachers and say that, hey, like this is my right to learn about this thing. So the public, public should be able to teach you this. If you're not that sure about your teacher's abilities to, <laughs> to teach you about programming, there is a lot of internet resources. There is this American organization called Code.org uh, that has collated a lot of resources, free resources to teach you the basics of programming through designing your first game, through designing, uh, like learning about JavaScript through all of these things. So code.org is a good place to start. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank you. Thank you.